shows, you can get a better idea where all these particular red arrows are represents these points that we just talked about. Near the poles, you'll see the 19.5 degree point, and near the equator, you'll see the two central arrows, and the same one in the South Pole. So what you have here are the major portal areas. Now there's a network of portals. And these portals are the major nodes of these portals are along these lines we've just described. And then uh, there are what are called subnodes. And along these subnodes, which may be in mountains, like the Andes, or the Rockies here in North America, or that may be in rivers or, li or lakes or streams. There's a famous portal in the Nile which is described in, by a lot of people who have had secret initiations and that the way you enter it is by getting in the Nile, knowing where it is, swimming and thinking certain sacred thoughts so that you can find it and then emerge or otherwise of course you're so far underneath the bottom of the river, you're right at the very bottom of the Nile, you would drown of course because of the undercurrents and the eddies, so it makes it very difficult, once you've even found it, to swim there. But even more so with the oceans, all of them are very, very deep. So let's have an example of what we're talking about here. Now let's look at a hidden portal. If you look at the top one, you'll see that the portal actually looks like a mountain. It doesn't look like there's a, any kind of a potential slide there that can cause, when it opens, for an opening. Now at the bottom you see the slide opened and you see the actual place where you can get in. Now all of these particular portals are set up so that they are either open by one of three ways. They're either open by thinking, telepathy, they're open by making a sound, or they're open by a special code of words. And or they may be combinations of all three so that the portal opens. That was done so that the Anunnaki would not find these things so easily. They are so well done that it's virtually impossible to determine that there's a portal on the other side of the mountain. So, what you have here is an article published in January 11, 2007 and written by John Stokes the national co-managing editor of The Canadian, an independent, not-for-profit national newspaper. The headline states, Scientists find extraterrestrial genes in human DNA. In the article, it reports that a group of researchers working in association with the Human Genome Project indicate that they made an astonishing scientific discovery. Their group leader, Professor Sam Chang, announced that after a lot of scientific analysis, they have discovered that 97% non-coding sequences in human DNA is of ET origin. These non-coding sequences in human DNA are also known as junk DNA. Because most scientists consider these portions of the gene to be useless garbage, to them, that portion of DNA does not code for proteins and appears to consist of meaningless and repeating sequences. It's actually a mystery to them. They don't know if it has any function. What you are looking at now is an article from BBC News. According to BBC News, dated April 26, 2006, a mathematical analysis of the human genome suggests that so-called junk DNA might not be so useless after all. A team from IBM has identified patterns or motifs that were found both in the junk areas of the gene and those which coded for proteins. What that means is that junk DNA might have an important function after all. It is interesting to note that junk DNA is common to all living things on Earth, from microbes to humans. According to Professor Chang, what we see in our DNA is a program consisting of two versions, a big code and basic code. My interpretation is that the basic code is currently an active DNA program. This creates a limited conscious human. And the big code is currently an inactive or dormant DNA program. 
when your basic code plus your big code are both active, it creates a fully conscious human. Professor Chang states, one, first fact is the complete program was positively not written on Earth. That is now a verified fact. Two, the second fact is that genes by themselves are not enough to explain evolution. There must be something more in the game. My commentary on the first fact is that the program was not written on Earth. Scientists are beginning to discover and admit the possibility of our ET origins, that we are not from here. On the second fact, that is the game, the game has rules. Divine consciousness makes creation. That is the game of creation. To give you a brief background, in 1962, James Watson and Francis Crick won the Nobel Prize for describing the double helix DNA molecule. In 1981, Crick published a theory he called directed panspermia that basically suggests that life on Earth originated not on Earth but from advanced ETs. It's explained in his book, Life Itself, Its Origins and Nature. In 1990, the Human Genome Project, headed by Watson, was launched to map out our DNA gene sequence. In other words, it was counting how many genes are needed to create a human body. Hundreds of scientists around the world contributed to this research, which reached its goal in 2003. At final count, we have approximately 22,000 genes in one cell, which is surprisingly much less than the genes of plants and other Earth creatures. So let's look at, at Inner Earth now. What we've talked about initially is how it's similar. In other words, there's mountains, there's lakes, there's rivers, there's an atmosphere. The difference is the bright, vibrant, central sun. Even though its light isn't as bright, it does provide a vast amount of life-giving energy for all the beings and all the animals and all the plants that live in inner earth. Now what we're going to talk about are, as you can see here, and I'm going to describe these six life tones in greater detail, but let me just uh, quickly name them for you so you can get a better idea of what we're talking about. Now the first zone on the top is the crystal cities, which we're going to be talking about a lot in a few minutes. The next part are the crystal caverns, which are also crystal cities, but these are the crystal cities in the cavern worlds. The third part is the Galactic Federation bases, which we're going to be describing when we go in to talk about the Crystal Cities. And then we have the various life zones of plants and animals. The first part that you see down here is for the various extinct animals. The next one is for the various dangerous extinct animals. And the final one is for the various creatures from our present surface ecology systems that have migrated to the inner earth. Now let's look at these many zones of Agartha in detail. As I said, there are six major life or ecological zones that exist in the inner earth lands of Agartha. The first is where the crystal cities are located. These are surrounded by special energy fields. One of the first things you will do when you approach the crystal cities, as we'll be talking about in a little bit, is you will notice immediately this wonderful heart energy and this heart energy is all about love and caring and making you feel a part of who and what they are and when I first went into inner earth that's the first thing that I remembered as I approached as I go through my various memories the first thing that I remembered the first impulse was of this energy the next thing you see as we'll be talking about when we go into inner earth is the whole process of looking at the colors the colors of the crystal cities shift all the time because what they're doing is they're taking the energy of the earth which is moving through them because all crystal cities are located on nodes and subnodes of the planet. Now what are these nodes and subnodes? A node is simply, if you were to take different ley lines, which are the energy lines of the planet, and stick them all together, there would be points where they all converge. And these are many major energy circuit points. These are places where, the, where you can plug in, so to speak, into the Earth's main energy core and feel the energies of the central sun and of the planet. 
And of course, as these different lines go from line, main ley lines to sublines, you have what are called the so-called subnodes. And they are similar. They're not as strong, but they're, they're subnodes. There are 12 of these major, because it's a 12-faceted crystal, there are 12 of these nodes on the planet. There are, the nodes go through the entire planet. So at the bottom of the planet, which is actually inner Earth, which to them is their top, is, of course, these same 12 nodes. And there are 144 of these subnodes which are connected through these minor ley lines to the main ley lines. And so if you were to actually look at the Earth and the field system, you would see a huge core of lines, thick lines, and every so often as you look, you would see these very, what would appear like, very lively, larger central points. These would be the major nodes, and then smaller points, which may change in their uh, diameter, but they're, they're lesser because they're hooked in to different degrees of these lesser lines. And so you would see larger lines, these main lines, or main ley lines as they're called here on the surface. These are what dowsers use to find water and also to find how the energy lines of the Earth operate. And then as you move outward, you get the lesser lines. And so if you could see these lines, you would see this multicolored aura of a planet shifting and changing colors, and these minor energy points changing as well, and the nodes also shifting in their color patterns. So this is what we're talking about. Now, if we were to look, as I said, the crystal cities are located on the surface of the planet and are also found within the Earth and different parts of the cavern worlds, which, which basically are from 40 miles to 400 miles. And of course the 400 mile point is roughly the center gravity point where the gravity energy switches between the inner Earth gravity and the outer or physical Earth that we're more used to. Now, these are the first two zones. The third zone are the various worldwide Galactic Federation of Light bases that are usually located in these caverns. What you'll have is a cavern crystal city and next to the cavern crystal city will be a base and it'll look like a small set of crystals. When we look at the crystal cities and you'll see the different illustrations, you'll see how they look like enormous right on a floor of crystals that you would find let's say in a crystal cave. You would see these huge sets of stalactites or whatever, depending on whether you're looking up or down. And you would see these patterns. And when you get to actual crystals, you would see crystals kind of sticking all over the place with their little uh, facets coming out. So what you have is this larger version, which is the Crystal City, and what we'll be talking about. But let's talk about the bases, since I don't really have illustrations of them. The bases are much smaller because they have three basic functions. First of all, all the ships of the Galactic Federation that may need certain degrees of maintenance are brought to these particular bases. The second thing happens is a lot of the planning for various operations that happen every day of the Galactic Federation, depending on the region of the Earth, happen in the appropriate Galactic Federation base. The third thing that happens is this is where various liaisons are housed that work with the, with the Crystal City peoples, the peoples of Agartha, in, desi in designing and preparing and carrying out various plans which are part also of the first contact. So in just about every crystal cavern that has a crystal city, you'll see these small things that look like smaller versions of the crystal city.